Have you ever wondered about the obscure origins and hidden meanings behind some of the most commonly used expressions in our language? Well, you're in luck. In this episode of Obscurate, we'll be exploring the stories and origins of popular phrases like rule of thumb, red herring, sleep tight, among other things. I began this journey when one of my kids asked me when I was putting them to bed, what does sleep tight mean? So I went down the rabbit hole and I wanted to share that journey with you. We will talk about their obscure origins, set the historical context of the time period they emerged from, and delve into how they came into being and gained popularity. Plus, we'll uncover how these phrases have transformed over time to become the common expressions we use today. And if you're a language lover like me, you won't want to miss our exploration of isolate languages. These are languages that have no known connection with any other existing language, making them a fascinating subject of study. So sit back, relax, and join us as we uncover the hidden gems and obscure references that shape the phrases we use in our daily lives. I want to kick off this broadcast with the phrase that started it all. Every day while I put my kids to bed, I always say these three sentences. Sleep tight, sleep cozy, sleep good, sleep lovely. This list keeps increasing every six months. But while I was telling that, one of my kids asked me, what does sleep tight mean? I went down a rabbit hole researching this and what I found kind of fascinated me to the extent that I found other phrases that we use every day that have completely bizarre origins and contexts on how they were created. Now, let's start with the phrase, the sleep tight phrase. In the 19th century, it was common for people to sleep on a bed that consisted of a mattress placed on top of the wooden frame with ropes woven through it. Now, these ropes needed to be tightened regularly to ensure a comfortable night's sleep. The process of tightening the ropes was known as sleeping tight, and hence the phrase. The phrase gradually evolved into the expression we use today. As the popularity of box springs and other types of bed frames grew in the 20th century, the practice of sleeping on a bed with woven ropes gradually fell out of favor. However, the expression sleep tight continued to be used. And it remains a popular way of wishing someone a restful night's sleep to this day. In addition to its literal meaning, the expression sleep tight has also taken a metaphorical meaning over time. It can be used to encourage someone to be resilient and strong or to stay focused and committed to a task. For example, a coach might tell their team to sleep tight before a big game as a way of reminding them to stay focused and committed to their match the next. So the next time you hear someone say sleep tight, remember that the phrase has its roots in the practicalities of bedding and mattress in the past. And whether you're sleeping on a modern mattress or a traditional bed with woven ropes, the sentiment behind the phrase remains the same. Wishing someone a peaceful and restful night's sleep. So if you're listening to this podcast in the night, sleep tight, sleep cozy, sleep lovely, sleep strong. One of the phrases that I've used a lot at work is rule of thumb. I say, hey, rule of thumb, do this, rule of thumb, you know, do that as your guideline, etc. This expression has a historical and rather bizarre origin in British common law. Specifically, a law that allowed men to beat their wives with a stick no wider than their thumb. I know, very controversial. The law known as the thumbstick rule was never actually codified and its existence is still a matter of debate among legal historians. However, the phrase rule of thumb has since become associated with this law and has taken on a broader meaning of using a rough estimation or approximation. As you can see, I couldn't find any historical records of this law, but its story and its past and its origins have been 
passed down as sort of a urban myth, hence the obscure nature of its origin. The written origins of this phrase, though, can be traced back to the 17th century when it was first used in print to describe a method of measurement that was based on a size of a person's thumb. This method was used by craftsmen and artisans to make rough estimates of length or distance. Over time, the phrase evolved to take on a broader meaning, referring to any rough estimate or approximation. In the 19th century, the phrase gained popularity in the United States, where it was often used in the context of agriculture and farming. Farmers would use rule of thumb to estimate the amount of seed or fertilizer needed for their crops. By the 20th century, the phrase had become a common part of our everyday language. I use it all the time when I'm cooking. You know, my recipes never taste the same. And it's still used today to describe a rough estimation and approximation. Despite its association with the thumbstick rule and the controversial past, the phrase rule of thumb has taken on a very huge popularity and broader meaning over time. It is now used in various contexts. Its historical origins, however, serve as a reminder of ways in which language and culture are interconnected. And how the stories behind the phrases we use every day can reveal so much about the world we live in. The next time you hear someone using a rule of thumb, always harken back to its controversial beginning. So this next phrase has a very curious introduction to me. So here is the fascinating story of red herring. Red herring is an expression that refers to a misleading or a distracting clue in a mystery or an investigation or in certain cases in writing. And let me give you the literal meaning of red herring. Red herring refers to red fish. Herring is a type of a fish. Why is it named after a fish? What are its origins? This is going to blow your mind. The origins of this metaphorical expression can be traced back all the way to the early 19th century when English journalist William Cobet wrote a fictional story about how he had used red herrings as a boy to throw hounds off the test scent of a hare. He used this anecdote to criticize his fellow journalists who had been misled by false information about a supposed defeat of Napoleon. Now, the term red herring has its roots in the practice of using smoked herring, which is a type of fish, to distract hunting dogs when they were training them. The herring fish were smoked during a particular type of wood that would turn them from a reddish color. The reason they used herring was because they were cheaper and they were very plentiful. The strong smell of the fish was used to confuse the dog following the scent of its intended target. In time, the dog would know how to tune this strong smell out and focus on honing to the scent of the target. And that's basically where the genesis of the idea of red herring came. Now, let's talk about an alternate version of this genesis. While it was believed that red herring were dragged against the ground to help train dogs to sniff out prey, British etymologist Michael Quinion has pointed out that they were actually used to train the horses who would they they were actually used to train the horses who would follow the scent trail and less likely to get spooked during a fox hunt. So the use was the same, but Michael Quinion hypothesized that it was not actually for the dogs, but it was used to train the horses. Likely it would have been used to train both. Now, the expression gained popularity in the 19th century and was used in a variety of contexts, from journalists, as I explained, to politics. The phrase was often used to describe a tactic of distracting or misleading opponents, and it quickly became a common part of our everyday language. Today, it is used in mysteries, in investigations, in reporting, in writing, as well as in discussions and political debates of all kinds. It's considered a type of flawed reasoning in which, you know, a detail or a remark is inserted into a discussion to sidetrack the conversation. 
if you were like the hunting dogs of the past, you would know how to hone in into your actual target and lose the distraction that the red herring in the script is giving. So I work in the tech field and the technology field is breeding ground for sometimes confusing and meaningless phrases or buzzword. I have heard this phrase countless times before, but never really knew the meaning behind it or the origins of it. The phrase that we're going to learn about is mumbo jumbo. Mambo jumbo is a phrase that's been used for centuries to describe language or a ritual that's seen as confusing or meaningless. But where does this actually phrase but where does this phrase actually come from and what's its history? It's very bizarre and obscure. The origins of Mambo Jumbo can be traced back to West Africa, where it was the name of a god known as Mambo Jumbo. This god was associated with secrecy and trickery, kind of like the Norse god Loki, and was believed to have the power to confuse or mislead people with his words. When Africans were brought to Americas as slaves, they brought their religious beliefs and practices with them. The name Mambo Jumbo was eventually anglicized to Mumbo Jumbo, and it became associated with the use of arcane or nonsensical language in religious or mystical contexts. Over time, the phrase mumbo jumbo came to be used more broadly to describe any language or ritual that was perceived as confusing or meaningless. It was often used as a derogatory term to criticize the beliefs and practices of people from different cultures and religions. But as you've seen, there's a lot more to the story than just a simple phrase. The history of mumbo-jumbo, as you've heard, is intertwined with the history of colonialism and cultural imperialism and slavery thrown in. By exploring the history and context of expressions like mumbo-jumbo, we can gain a deeper meaning of the ways in which language was shaped by our actions of the past. So the next time you hear someone use the phrase mumbo-jumbo, remember it's complicated history and the role it played in shaping our modern language. So the next phrase that we're going to talk about is a phrase that actually stood out to me visually. We have a really awesome bagel place by our house. It's called New York Bagel, and it serves the best bagels in town. And every time I go, I get a baker's dozen. And I've always wondered, what is a baker's dozen? And, you know, the... And while researching, I found the obscure origin of baker's dozen and how it's transformed over time. So this is the story of the baker's dozen. So baker's dozen is an expression that refers to a quantity of 13. Not the dozen, which is 12. A dozen means 12, and baker's dozen means 13. The origins of this term can be traced back to medieval England when bread was a staple food and bakers played a critical role in the food supply chain. In those days, bakers were often subjected to strict regulations and quality standards, as bread was the most common source of sustenance for a general population. One of the ways that bakers were held accountable for their products was through weight measures. So bakers were required to sell bread by weight, and if they were caught shortchanging customers or using underweight loaves, they could face very severe penalties. To avoid the risk of being accused of skimping on the product, bakers began to include an extra loaf of bread in every dozen they sold. This way, if one of the loaves was underweight, the customer would still receive the required amount of bread. The extra loaf was known as the inbread. And the practice became so common that it, that it was eventually codified into law. By the 16th century, the term baker's dozen had entered the common lexicon, and it was being used to describe a quantity of 13 rather than 12. 
the practice of giving an extra loaf of bread eventually faded away, although I would have loved for that to still happen. But the phrase baker's dozen remained a part of our language. Today, baker's dozen is still used to describe a quantity of 13, and it has even been incorporated into some modern baking practices. In some recipes, bakers will use slightly more than the required ingredients to ensure that they end up with a full baker's dozen of baked goods. So, by exploring the history and context of expressions like these, we get a deeper appreciation for the ways in which people were able to implement practices around laws, quality control, etc. And it's a very common practice even used today. You'd rather give someone extra to get a good review than to give them exactly the same and avoid a bad review. Our next part of the podcast, we're going to take a deep dive into the world of isolate languages. First of all, what are these isolate languages? These are obscure languages that are not related to any other known language. They exist in various parts of the world, from the Basque language spoken in the Pyrenees Mountains to the Ainu language spoken in Japan. These languages have a bizarre family tree of origin and existence. These languages are incredibly rare and offer a fascinating glimpse into the history of human communication. The origins of these languages are shrouded in mystery, as you might have guessed, based on the fact that they don't have any known, uh, known language connections. Some linguists believe that they may be the last remaining remnants of ancient languages that have long since disappeared. Others suggest that these languages may have developed in isolation from other languages, perhaps due to geographic or cultural barriers. Let's dive deep into some of these languages. One of the most famous examples of an isolate language is the Basque language. The Basque language or Euskara is spoken in the Basque country, a region spanning the border between Spain and France. It's considered an isolate language because it is not related to any other known language family. This has led to much speculation about its origins, with some theories suggesting that it may be a remnant of a pre-Indo-European language family that was once spoken throughout Europe. And that is a whole nother fascinating culture and history that we can explore in another podcast. Despite its unique status, Basque is a thriving language with a strong cultural presence. It has a rich literary tradition and is taught in schools throughout the Basque country. It also features prominently in Basque culture with many songs, poems, and works of art written in the language. So, even though it's an isolated language, it has a very strong connection to the people and very strong connection to their culture. The Ainu language, on the other hand, is spoken by the Ainu people of northern Japan. Like Basque, it is also an isolate language with no known connections, but it is one of the languages that has been fading. It was spoken throughout Hokkaido, but today there are only a few hundred fluent speakers left. The origins of this language is not well understood, but it is thought to have developed in relative isolation from other languages due to Ainu people's traditional way of life, which was based on hunting, fishing, and gathering. They obviously did not have a lot of connections with trade, etc., and so on and so forth. Despite its decline, though, there are efforts being made to preserve and revitalize the Ainu language. This is being done through language revitalization programs and cultural education initiatives. I do feel that AI has a big role to play in preservation of these languages. Sticking with Asia for our next one, 
Purushaski is a language spoken in the northern Pakistan, primarily in the Hanza and Nagar valleys. It is one of the few isolate languages spoken in South Asia, and it has been the subject of a lot of study and speculation by linguists. The origins of Purushaski language are still largely unknown. Some linguists believe it may have originated from an ancient language family that has since disappeared. I'm guessing they were thinking about the Indo-European language family that was spoken a while back. While others have suggested that it may have developed because of the isolation due to the remote mountain regions where it is spoken, similar to like how the Ainu was. But despite its small number of speakers, Purushaski is a linguistically complex language. It has no case system and verbs are highly inflected, with numerous verb forms used to indicate tense, aspect, and mood. If you want to know the pop culture reference to this, it's basically squanch. Let's now head down to Africa. We have this Sandave language spoken by the Sandave people of Tanzania. Like Baskin, I knew it is an isolate language with no connections. It's believed to have been developed in relative isolation in the area known as Tanzania, with some theories suggesting that it may have once been spoken across a much larger region of Eastern Africa. The Sandave language is known for its complex grammar, which features a number of unusual features such as tonal accents and complex verbal constructions. Despite its complexity, it remains an important part of Sandave culture, with many songs, stories, and works of art composed in that language. So the secret to keeping some of these isolate languages alive and rich is to keep it in the culture with works of art. That is why it's critical for us to treat language not just as a medium of communication, but also treat it as a documentation of history. Now, coming to the Americas, which also has an isolate language in this part of the world, the Haida language. The Haida language is spoken by the Haida people of Haida Gawai. Formerly, it was known as Queen Charlotte Islands in British Columbia, Canada. It is one of the few isolate languages spoken in North America, and it has a rich history and culture. The Haida language is known for its complex grammar, which features a large number of inflections, prefixes, and suffixes. But as you might have guessed, each of these isolate languages are so complex with their own features that it just begs the question, are they really isolate? It is also known for its intricate use of metaphor and symbolism. This is reflected in the Haida's people's rich tradition of totem poles and other works of art. Like many isolate languages, this is also in danger of disappearing. There are currently only a few dozen fluent speakers left, and efforts are being made to preserve and re revitalize the language. This, was, this is being done through the language revitalization programs and cultural initiatives. So why are these languages important? For one, they help us to understand the incredible diversity of human communication. They remind us that language is not a fixed entity, but it is always a constantly changing, evolving aspect of human culture. The languages we speak today may be unrecognizable and isolate to the people of the future. Furthermore, the study of these languages has the potential to reveal insights into the history of human migration and cultural exchange. By understanding the linguistic relationships between different people, we can always gain a better and deeper understanding of our shared history and the forces that have shaped this. The next time you encounter an obscure, isolate language, remember that you are encountering a linguistic treasure. By exploring the history and context of these fascinating languages, we can gain a greater appreciation about the incredible diversity of our world. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of Obscurate. Join us next time as we explore another fascinating aspect of our everyday lives. Our next episode, we will be curating the obscure references in pop culture, one of my favorite subjects of study.